Hey guys, and welcome back to Architecture and Programming Models for GPUs and Coprocessors. And today we're going to start talking about our last part, which is on sorting on GPUs. And this is actually a rather short part, so I'm quite confident that I'll be able to finish this off within a single session. And this would actually mark today's session, the last session of the semester. And as always, let's start this part by discussing the objectives. And the objectives are that on the one hand, we'll learn how to construct parallel sorting algorithms. So in particular, we will learn about something that is called a sorting network. And a sorting network will basically allow us to devise parallel sorting algorithms and a specific parallel sorting algorithm that we will uh, discuss and that we will devise using sorting networks is the uh, so-called platonic sort algorithm. And we will discuss the platonic sort algorithm and we will uh, not only construct the algorithm and we will not only derive the algorithm, but we will also discuss its uh, complexity. And we will see how we can do this based on those sorting networks. And then in the very end, we'll see in a kind of a case study fashion, we will see how to port the platonic sort algorithm to the GPU using the CUDA API. And we will thereby also see how to take a non-trivial serial C++ algorithm and transform it so that it exposes enough parallelism so that it will scale on a GPU. So, and with those objectives in place, let's start right away. And let's actually start by repeating some concepts. And those concepts, uh, they should be known to you as part of the requirements for this lecture are that you are familiar with topics from Computer Science 1. And anyway, let's just repeat some basic topics from sorting. And let's just define the sorting problem. And uh, the sorting problem is defined in terms of two sequences, the input sequence and the output sequence. And the input sequence we are given. And the uh, input sequence is just a, a sequence of numbers uh, with an order relation on them. So in particular, with the order relation less than or equal. And the output when we apply a sorting algorithm to this sequence is a permutation of that sequence so that when we pick two elements of the output sequence, the two elements are ordered with respect to the order relation. So in particular, if we pick a pair of elements, then the element to the left is less than or equal to the element of the right in that pair. And in computer science one, you guys discussed a bunch of different sorting algorithms. So in one class of sorting algorithms that you guys probably placed a strong focus on in Computer Science 1 were the so-called comparison-based sorting algorithms. And the idea here is that we iterate over the input sequence in a certain predetermined order, like the order is prescribed by the algorithm that we use. And then we perform pairwise comparisons of the elements in the sequence and conditionally swap the elements if the order relation isn't fulfilled. And there are a couple of comparison-based sorting algorithms that you guys probably discussed. And some of those were, for example, insertion sort or selection sort, merge sort, quick sort, and so on. And for the sake of our discussion, let us actually briefly recap the insertion sort algorithm as I will later base some of the argument that I'll make about sorting networks off of that algorithm. And let's just informally do so. And informally, the insertion sort algorithm goes as follows. Like with the insertion sort algorithm, when we're in a iteration, then we'll, we're presented with an already sorted sequence AL. So, and then it is our task to enter a element into that sorted sequence AL. And therefore, we just iterate over the sequence from left to right. So and then we find the first pair of elements in that sorted sequence, where if we would place our element there, the order relation would be fulfilled. And this is the place where we enter the element. And then we just place the element there and take all the elements that are to the right of that position. We move them one element further to the right. So this is the principle behind the insertion sort algorithm. And uh, you usually start the insertion sort algorithm off with a single element. You usually pick the leftmost element, the element A0. And the element A0 trivially fulfills the condition that it is already sorted, as it's just a single element. 
And we then just start the iteration by picking the uh, second to left element, so the element A1, and we enter it into the already sorted sequence. So, and so that means for the uh, one element sequence, we will either enter it to the left, and then we will move A0 to the right by one element, or we just place it to the right of A0, and this leaves us with another sorted sequence. And then we will uh, take the next element from the sequence, like the element A2, and then we'll try to enter that into the sequence. Like, here's just a very quick example of that. We start, like, this is our sequence that we're going to sort, and the sequence isn't sorted yet. And we start trivially with the first element, giving us the sequence AL, which consists of just the element with value 6. And we start by inserting the second element, so the element A1, into that sequence. And we just see there's less than 6. And therefore, we just place it to the left of 6. So then we continue our iteration by picking the 2 and trying to enter that into the already sorted sequence AL. And we find that 2 is less than 4, and therefore we place 2 at the beginning of the sequence and move all elements that are right from that position, we, we move it one element further to the right. And then we proceed with that with the element with value 8, and we see that the value 8 is the highest value in the sequence, and therefore uh, it'll end up uh, to the very right end. I mean, you see where this is going, so that in the end we have uh, sorted our sequence. So, and as you can see, there are just many decisions we have to make in order to arrive at the final solution. And quite interestingly, there's actually, with every comparison-based sorting algorithm, and for every given input sequence length n, there's a decision tree, and we can use that decision tree by traversing it in order to arrive at the permutation that transforms the input sequence A into the output sequence A prime. So and as there are uh, n factorial permutations of the input sequence A, our decision tree will also have n factorial leaves because the uh, permutations are actually at the leaves. And this obviously marks this type of approach or a potential algorithm that is associated with that rather unusable, like in practice, we'll not be able to construct a decision tree for input lengths higher than, like, say, 4 or 5. But anyway, let's just have a look at an example that's of, of how that works, because it will help us with our later understanding of the sorting networks that we will subsequently discuss. So our decision tree uh, will be comprised of, uh, of leave nodes, and as said, those leave nodes they store the actual permutations of the input sequence. And then we have inner nodes, and those inner nodes, they help us make a decision based on the uh, elements of the input sequence that we're currently comparing. Like each inner node is associated with an i and a j in regard to the input sequence. And it will tell us, based on the comparison uh, of the two elements, if we go to the left or to the right when we traverse the decision tree. So let's actually have a look at an example. Like this here would be the decision tree for insertion sort and for n equals 3. Uh, as you can see, we have like a bunch of inner nodes here. And then uh, at the leave nodes, we have those permutations. And the permutations will tell us how to transform the input sequence into the output sequence. Like let's just have a look at an example. Like our input sequence is this one here. It is 8, 4, and 2. So, and then we'll just play through our insertion sort algorithm. So we'll again start with our uh, trivial AL sequence, A0, uh, which is 8. And we will then see that uh, when we compare A0 and A1, we'll see that the comparison um, evaluates to greater than. So we traverse to the right. And the next comparison that we make is that between the elements 0 and 2, so the, between the elements A0 and A2, and again, that comparison, like 8 is greater than 2, um, that comparison will tell us that we traverse the tree to the right. And then our final comparison that is prescribed by the insertion sort algorithm tells us to compare the elements A1 and A2. And again, A2 is less than A1. And therefore, we go to the right, and then we'll, we, we arrive at a leaf node, and that leaf node will tell us the permutation for the input sequence. And as you can see, if we apply that permutation to the input sequence, then our final sequence is sorted. And let's just play this through for another example. 
like for this example, two, uh, four, three here. And again, our first comparison is A0 versus A1. But now the comparison evaluates to less than or equal, like the element A0 is less than A1. So we traverse to the left. The next comparison evaluates to greater than, so we traverse to the right. And the final comparison, again, makes us traverse to the left. And we arrive at our final permutation. And if we applied this permutation to the input sequence, the input sequence would be sorted. So doing this for uh, input sizes greater than 3 or 4 or maybe 5 is, of course, impractical. But it allows us to reason about what is called a sorting network. So and the motivation for sorting networks actually comes from computer architecture, so from hardware design. And the uh, question underlying the sorting networks is basically what a integrated circuit would look like that would transform an unsorted input sequence A into a sorted output sequence A prime. Like quite similar to what we saw with the decision tree. Like with the decision tree, we were basically given a input sequence that wasn't sorted. And in a very similar fashion to like a to an integrated circuit, we would just follow certain paths through that tree and would arrive at a permutation, and then we would just apply that permutation to the input sequence, giving us the output sequence. And while decision trees are impractical for larger input sizes, sorting networks go into a bit of a different direction, but actually built on concepts from decision trees. So in particular, sorting networks are comprised of what is called a comparator. And a comparator is basically this black box here, and the black box's inputs are elements AI and AJ. So those are the inputs. And these inputs are transformed into outputs. And the output will just be that at the top output, so at the uh, first output of the comparator, uh, we'll have the minimum of the two elements, of the two input elements, and at the bottom we will have the maximum of the two inputs. So comparators basically have parts, very similar to what we would see in an integrated circuit, and the comparator will compare the two input elements that are applied to the input parts, uh, will compare them and will potentially swap them, so then in the end at the output parts uh, we have the minimum and the maximum applied. So, and given those comparators, uh, we can actually connect them using wires. So these here are wires, and those here are just a bunch of comparators. And this here is a, a sorting network that corresponds to the uh, insertion sort algorithm. Like, I will not derive that, but just to tell you that this is the insertion sort algorithm for an input length of 6, so a, for a fixed input length. And if we just apply like a, a certain input sequence to the wires at the very beginning and uh, subject the input sequence to all those comparators, then in the end the uh, sequence will be sorted. And in order to illustrate why this is helpful for us, like uh, the motivation here is integrated circuits and hardware design, but for our purposes, like uh, what we're after is an algorithm that scales on a GPU, those uh, sorting networks are actually also very helpful. Because if I shuffle those comparators a bit differently, like this illustration here is the very same from before, like if you compare that, uh, those are the same operations. Like but if you can, for instance, see that this comparator here and that comparator down here can execute in parallel, right? So I can just draw them on top of each other. And like those here, there would be a collision. Like if I would like to place this comparator on top of that comparator here, there would be a collision. So this is not valid. And therefore, I can now reason about how much parallelism there is in my sorting network. And therefore, I can also reason about how much parallelism is exposed by the algorithm. And like as you would have guessed, actually, the insertion sort algorithm exposes very little parallelism. And we will later see an algorithm that exposes much more parallelism. And let us actually really have a look at an example of how those sorting networks are applied to an input sequence. And we take this input sequence 684712 here, and we'll transform it into the sorted sequence using the sorting network. And therefore, we just subject the sequence to all those comparators. And we start with the first comparator, which will act on elements A0 and A1. 
I will swap them so that they become 4 and 6. And the second comparator will take the input that is now provided on wire 1 and on wire 2 and will again swap them as they are 6 and 2. And the next two comparators can execute in parallel. And they will swap their elements as they are passed through from the two comparators from before. And then we have a couple of more parallel stages that are executed by our serving network. And if you play this through, then you will see that eventually the final sequence that is present on the wires is sorted. So, and let's actually introduce a couple of definitions. So comparators are just elements C of I and J who transform an input pair A of I and A of J into an ordered pair minimum of AIJ, maximum of AIJ. And then there's uh, something called a comparator stage. And a comparator stage is basically just the set of comparators that can be executed in parallel at a certain time step. And more formally, a comparator stage is just a set of adjacent comparators whose input pairs and whose input wires are non-overlapping. Yeah, so when we have the comparators on that stage, those uh, comparators are comprised of inputs i, j, k, l, and so forth, and neither of those inputs is allowed to be the same. So those comparators, if they are adjacent, they uh, form a comparator stage, and a comparator network, like a comparator network, not necessarily a sorting network, is just a sequence of comparator stages for a fixed input size n. So this here is a comparator network. It also happens to be a sorting network because it sorts the uh, input sequence into the correct order. And in general, all uh, sorting networks are also comparator networks. And as you can see from this formal uh, definition, and in particular uh, from the definition of what a comparator stage is, we can now also read off the parallel complexity of a comparator network and of the algorithm associated with that comparator network. Like in particular, the number of comparators will just tell us the work complexity of the algorithm. And the number of comparator stages will tell us the time complexity. So, and with that, we can reason about the parallel complexity of a algorithm that is associated with a comparator network, like for example, a parallel algorithm that uh, could run on a PRAM. So the uh, number of comparators is the work complexity, the number of comparator stages is the time complexity. And we also define the depth of a comparator network, and the depth is just the uh, number of comparator stages. So uh, let us actually extend this definition a little bit, because so far we always assumed that comparators would just sort from top to bottom, so that the uh, top element output by the comparator would be the minimum and the bottom output would be the maximum of the input pair. And this is not a necessity, and we'll just introduce this notation here, and we will actually later need it, because for the Batonic sort algorithm, it is required that our comparators are able to sort the uh, input pairs into different order, like into either ascending or descending order. And the direction of this arrow here will just tell us where the minimum will be. Like when the uh, arrow points down, that means that the minimum is at the top and the maximum is at the bottom. And when the arrow points up, that means that we will put the maximum to the top and the minimum to the bottom. So, and we are, of course, not only interested in comparator networks, but also in sorting networks. So, and as per our definition, sorting networks are those comparator networks that actually sort the input sequence with respect to the order relation. And there's actually a definition or a theorem that induces sorting networks that has a weaker input condition. And that weaker input condition is that a comparator network not only is a sorting network when it sorts its input, but in particular, it'll sort any arbitrary input if 
it also sorts the two to the n possible sequences that just consist of zeros and ones. And this is called the zero one principle. So if we have a comparator network, and that comparator network successfully sorts every sequence of zeros and ones for the given input length, then the comparator network is also a sorting network. That is, it is able to sort any given input sequence with the order relation. And that's, of course, a much weaker condition because in contrast to the n factorial possible inputs given when the AIs are arbitrary or real numbers or integers, with zeros or ones, we only have two to the n permutations. And this principle is actually quite easy to prove, and we will do this using monotony. And for that, we will just consider a monotonous function f of x, so that given two inputs x and y, f of x is less than or equal f of y, if x is less than or equal y. And we're also given a comparator network, and that comparator network just transforms the sequence a to the sequence a prime. And therefore, as we have this monotonous function over sequences, the comparator network n will also transform the sequence f of a0 to f of a n minus 1 to f of a prime 0 to f of prime n minus 1. So let us now assume that the network n is a comparator network and it also sorts 0, 1 sequences, so sequences that are only comprised of zeros and ones. So we're now also assuming that the network n does not sort arbitrary pairs of elements. Huh? So we assume it'll sort 0, 1 sequences, but we also assume it'll not sort arbitrary sequences where the elements aren't necessarily 0 or 1. And let us now just uh, choose a, a particular f. So in particular, we're choosing f as follows. We're picking an arbitrary a prime from the input sequence. And whenever a element a prime is uh, less than that chosen a prime, so that chosen a prime i, well, we set it to zero, and otherwise we set it to one. And as we assumed that the input sequence a is not sorted, that would also imply that, due to this mapping, the sequence f of a prime 0 to f of a prime n minus 1 is unsorted. And so we would end up with an unsorted 0, 1 sequence because we have this mapping from arbitrary elements to zeros and ones. And thus we would end up with an unsorted 0, 1 sequence and this would be a contradiction because we assumed that the network sorts 0, 1 sequences in the first place. So and that property will later come in handy because when we construct sorting algorithms, then we only have to do so for zero one sequences. And via this property, it is guaranteed that a sorting network will then also sort arbitrary sequences. And uh, this is actually quite helpful. So let's now start discussing the Bitonic sort algorithm and let's actually construct a sorting network for the Bitonic sort algorithm. And for that, we first have to define um, what Bitonic means, actually. And Bitonic means that we have a sequence that uh, consists of two halves. And the sequence uh, either increases or decreases monotonically until a certain peak or a valley is reached. And then it starts decreasing or increasing. Like, we'll discuss this in terms of 0, 1 sequences, but arbitrary sequences can be Bitonic. And in general, we have a 0, 1 sequence being bitonic. If it increases, so if it consists of zeros, and then it's followed by a 1, and the uh, 1 forms a peak, and then follow only once, and then it uh, decreases once to 0, and then it stays 0. Or conversely, where we start at once, and then we, we end up in a valley of zeros, and then we go up to ones again. Like those here are uh, bitonic sequences, and in particular they are bitonic zero one sequences. Like we start with zeros and then comes this peak of ones, and then we go down to zero again. And here's another example where we end up in a valet. Those sequences here, like the sequences consisting only of zeros and the sequences consisting only of ones are also bitonic. And so are sequences that are only monotonic in one direction. So 
But tonic sequences are basically monotonic sequences where there is a peak, and after we reach that peak, the sequence is monotonic in the other direction. So for our discussion of the botonic sort algorithm, let us uh, first, like I say, building block, basically, consider the following comparator network. And I'll just refer to this network over and over again, so it's important that we uh, discuss this network real quick. And the network I will call the NN, like, for instance, for an input sequence length of uh, 6, the NN will be the N6, and this here is the N6. So, and what the NN does is it splits our input sequence into two halves and then it will compare the corresponding elements from the two halves. Like in the case of the N6, it will compare the element 0 with the element 3. And the element 3 is actually the 0th element of the second half. And the element 4 is the first element of the second half. So it will compare the elements, the corresponding elements from the two halves and we'll put the smaller elements in the first half and the bigger elements in the second half. So, and here's a property of the NN that is important. Like, given a 0, 1 input sequence of length n and n is even, when we apply the NN to that sequence, then we will end up with two new subsequences, like with the sequence a prime 0 through n half minus 1, and the second subsequence n2 prime 0 to n2 prime n over 2 minus 1. And there's this property that those two sequences on their own are bitonic if the input sequence is bitonic. Yeah. So given a bitonic input sequence, the nn will subdivide the sequence into two subsequences, and those two subsequences are bitonic. So, and this is an important property, and we're now discussing a proof of that property, and the proof is actually quite tedious, because you have to show this for uh, several cases. Like, the input sequences can come in certain different flavors. Like, there are trivial input sequences that only consists of zeros or ones, and for those it's quite obvious. Like, the uh, network will basically just construct two subsequences that are only zeros or that are only ones and those are obviously bitonic. And for the non-trivial cases, we have to show that this is true too. And the non-trivial sequences, we can, in terms of their median, we can distinguish them. Like there are sequences that are zero everywhere to the left, and then there's a peak in the right half, and then there are sequences where the peak is just around the center, like around the middle of the original sequence. And then there's this third variant where the peak is in the left half. So we got uh, those three cases. And then there are, of course, the uh, negated variants of those, like where the peaks are actually valets, and we would just replace all the zeros with ones and vice versa. So um, we would have to actually prove this for these three types of sequences, but we will not. Like, we will only prove this for one type. And in particular, we will show this for the variant where the block of ones actually straddles the position n over 2, like this case here in the middle where we have ones uh, around the center position. So this is what we are looking at. We are looking at sequences where we have where we have the center point, where we have zeros to the left, and then we have k ones that are all left of the center point followed by L ones that are right of the center point, and that again is followed by n half minus L zeros that are to the right of the sequence. So this is uh, the type of sequence that we we're looking at, and that actually leaves us with more cases that we have to distinguish. Like the thing is now that we can have um, either more ones on the left than we have on the right, so that k is uh, greater than L, or conversely that L is greater than k, and of course, the two can be equal, so we subsum that in the just in the first case. So we have to distinguish those two cases. So either the case where k plus l is less than or equal n over 2, or the other case where k plus l is greater than n over 2. That is the one case where we have more zeros than we have ones, 
or the uh, second case where we have more ones than we have zeros. And this is also the reason why this is so tedious to prove, because we, we have to distinguish similar cases for all the other initial cases that we saw earlier. So the way I'm drawing this here, like with this uh, center point, with this bar here indicating the center point, this actually allows us to, to draw those sequences differently. Like I can actually just place them on top of each other, right? Just like I can, I'll place the first half, I can, I'll place it on top of the second half. And um, so now if we apply the NN to that sequence, uh, that would basically look like this. Like we would have our comparators and we would just draw our comparators into those two slices. And like as we always compare like the first element from the first half with the first element from the second half and the second element from the first half with the second element from the second half and so on. This is just the operation in terms of those arrows indicating comparisons. This is just the operation that the NN would perform, right? So uh, in this case, like in this first case where k plus l is less than n over 2 or equal to n over 2, what we end up is uh, this geometric setup here where we have those L ones to the left of the bottom most slice and where we have those K ones to the right of the uh, topmost slice. And if we apply the NN to those two sequences, what we end up is the sequence where we have zeros only to the left and where we have L ones to the left of the second subsequence followed by zeros and uh, that is followed by k ones. So, and this is a geometrical proof of that the NN, if applied to this type of sequence here, like to this zero one sequence that is also platonic, this is a geometric proof that what we end up with is two subsequences and those two subsequences are platonic too. So because this sequence here consisting only of zeros is uh, trivially Batonic, and this here is also a batonic sequence per our definition. So we now proved our uh, first case, like the case where k plus l is less than n over 2, and we have to also prove that for the case that k plus l is greater than n over 2, and the proof is actually quite similar in a sense that we can again draw those two on top of each other. And, like, and when we do so, and again apply the nn, what we end up with is one sequence where we have k plus l minus n over 2 ones on the left side, like in the left half, and where the right half is all ones. So there are those tiny geometrical proofs that allow us to show the property that the nn takes the platonic 0, 1 input sequence and turns that input sequence into 2 subsequences that are bitonic. So, and the other variants, they can be proved quite similarly. And nevertheless, I will leave that as an exercise for you. So here are a couple of important observations. The first observation is that when we apply the NN, then we end up with two subsequences and the corresponding elements from these subsequences are ordered. So the element zero from the first subsequence is uh, less than or equal the first element from the second sequence and so on. We uh, also observe that the two sequences will have the same properties of monotony as the original sequence has. So if we have an input sequence that is bitonic, then the two new resulting subsequences are also bitonic. And then there's the zero one principle and the zero one principle tells us that the same properties are also true for like arbitrary platonic sequences. And this is actually quite useful because um, with those properties we can actually imagine a very simple divide and conquer approach and this divide and conquer approach would just see us recursively executing the NN, giving us a new comparator network and that a comparator network would sort arbitrary bitonic uh, input sequences. Like this is actually quite easy to see. Like if we have a batonic zero one input sequence applied here, then if we applied the n eight to this input sequence of length n equals eight, then what we would end up with is two sub sequences, both being batonic, right? And all the elements here 
are smaller than the elements from the second uh, sequence. So we would apply this again, and then we would end up with two per each half more bitonic sequences. And if we recursively apply the uh, nn, like if we first apply the n4 two times, and as you can already see, we can parallelize all that. If we recursively apply those networks, then in the end, we would, um, like we would end up with trivial sequences, like the sequence a0 and a1 would be trivially sorted, because uh, this is just a property of the nn. And because in the previous executions of the nn, we uh, shuffled all the smaller elements to the left and the bigger elements to the right, we would end up with a monotonic sequence and with the uh, sequence being monotonic, the sequence would of course also be sorted. So if we concatenate several instances of the NN in this way, then we can sort with, with that any 0-1 sequence if the 0-1 sequence is bitonic. And we can also see, like, like what we uh, can see very nicely here, is certain properties of the NN that are favorable in terms of parallelization. Like the NN in and of itself allows for parallelization because there are no data dependencies between the comparators that the NN is comprised of. So we can parallelize all the comparators uh, inside the NN. And when there are two NNs that operate on different parts of the input sequence, then we can actually also parallelize those. So we already have the first half of a sorting algorithm that is obviously scalable. And we only have this issue that the input to this half of the sorting algorithm requires our uh, sequence to be botonic. And therefore, we need to find a method to ensure that the sequence that we put in here is actually botonic. So what we now need is a algorithm that takes an arbitrary unsorted 0-1 sequence and makes it bitonic. So and here's how we approach this. And we'll basically just use the network that we just derived and we'll use the property that this network sorts sequences that are already bitonic. And the very first thing that we should observe is that every sequence of length 2, like every 0, 1 sequence of length 2, per definition is bitonic, right? So those are either 0, 1, 1, 0, or 0, 0, or 1, 1, and all those sequences are bitonic. And therefore, we, like we first make an assumption that the input length is actually a power of 2, and we'll uh, stick with that, actually. And then we just chunk our input sequences into pairs. Like we'll end up with n over 2 pairs. And then we use the network that we just derived, like in the particular case, the network is really just the n2. And we apply the network and we apply it alternatingly so that we sort every odd of those pairs into ascending order. And every even pair, we sort it into descending order, right? Like we, we take the first pair and we sort it into ascending order, and we take the uh, second pair and sort it into descending order. And then we take the third pair, sort it into ascending order, the um, fourth pair into descending order, and so forth. And then we just take those pairs and combine them. Like we take the first two pairs and combine them to a tuple of length 4. And this tuple of length 4 is by tonic 2, right? like per definition, as we sort uh, the first pair into ascending and the second pair into descending order. And all those tuples that we just created are bitonic. And as per our definition, the network that we derived earlier, like the recursive network that is comprised of the NNs, is able to sort bitonic sequences. So we just take the recursive network from before for input uh, sequences of length 4 and apply them to those tuples of length 4. And we again sort them, and we take the first tuple and uh, sort it into ascending order. And we take the second tuple and sort it into descending order. And you can already see where this is going, right? Like, uh, this is the first iteration where we just sort pairs. Then we sort tuples of length 4. We then sort tuples of length 8. And then until we finally sort tuples of length n over 2. And we sort those, so that in the end, the first tuple is ascending and the second tuple is descending. And if we take those two tuples or those two subsequences, 
and combine them to a single sequence, then that uh, sequence is platonic and this is just what we were after, right? So what we were after was a comparator network that transforms an arbitrary 0, 1 sequence into a platonic sequence, and this is just what we just derived. So the comparator network for that looks as follows, like I'm showing this here for a length 8, and for larger input sizes, we would just have more comparator stages, like for length 16, we would have one more execution of the uh, recursive network. And uh, for length 8, you can see here, like I'm applying the N2, like the recursive network of length 2, uh, which happens to be the N2, I'm applying it to the pairs, all right? And then I am taking the recursive network for length 4, which is comprised of the N4, and then of two more executions of the N2. Uh, and I apply this to sort the first tuple, the first tuple of length 4, to sort it into ascending order. And then I take the same recursive network, um, but with opposite direction, and use it to sort the second tuple into descending order. So um, if I combine the two networks, like this is the network that we just derived, and this here is the network that we were, we were using, like this is the ne same network for length 8 that I'm also using here to sort the first uh, tuple of length 4 into ascending order. And if I combine those twos, then after the, like in this case for n equals h, after the first three comparator stages I have a sequence that is platonic, and the platonic sequence I can just uh, sort into ascending order using the recursive network. So and if I analyze the parallel complexity of this network, then I end up with a number of comparator stages that is just one half log n times log n plus one. And the number of comparators per comparator stage is n over two. And from that it follows that the work complexity wn of the platonic sort algorithm is O of n log squared n, and the time complexity Sn is O of log squared n. And this is actually not optimal, like the algorithm here is not cost optimal. And it just so happens that there are sorting algorithms that are cost optimal, and that have a, a better complexity actually, but uh, they happen to be not so easy to derive, and therefore we will uh, stick with the uh, complexity that I'm showing here, which is actually quite good, and with the algorithm that actually has superior scalability. And with that we constructed, and we also analyzed the botonic sort algorithm using sorting networks. And let us now consider a quick example to see the botonic sort algorithm in action. So, and here's the example that we're going to use. Like, we're going to sort this sequence that is already sorted, like the sequence going from 2 to 9. And we'll just apply the platonic sort network and we'll see how it first scrambles that sequence. And I'll make it platonic, like it is already platonic, but we'll make it platonic in, uh, in a different way. And then we will see how it will sort it again. And like, I will use a color coding where whenever I compare pairs of elements, I indicate that by using the same color, like the blue indicates that this is a pair that I'm comparing. And the light blue, so the light color, is always associated with the, with the tip of the arrow, actually. So, and on the uh, first stage of the network, I apply the N2, basically, and I apply this alternatingly, and I basically sort those pairs into ascending order, and into descending order, and into ascending order, and into descending order, so that I end up with this new sequence here. So our next stage will now start sorting the quadruples here, like those tuples of length 4, it will start making them by tonic. Like, it's actually this uh, whole network here that makes the first tuple bitonic and ascending, and it's this one here, like the whole thing, both comparator stages, that make the second tuple descend. But we start with the first stage, like we, with the N4 here, and we'll just uh, take the 2 and the 5 and keep them as is, and we'll take the 4 and the 3 and keep them, but the uh, 6 and the 9 need to be swapped, and the 7 and the 8 are also swapped. So the next stage applies the N2 parts that are associated with this part of the recursive network here. Like it will sort the respective pairs. And the tips are like the tips of the first two comparisons are pointing down. 
the tips of the uh, second two are uh, pointing up. And so what we end up with is a sequence that in and of itself is platonic. Uh, like uh, we have this ascending sequence here, and we have this descending sequence here, and we're finished with the first part of the network, and we now have a platonic sequence that we just subject to this recursive network here that can sort by tonic sequences so that they are sorted with respect to the order relation. And we first apply the N8, and the N8 will take each pair uh, whose elements are at a distance of N over 2, uh, and we'll sort them, and we'll sort them into ascending order, like per construction. And like for this sequence, there's actually nothing uh, that we need to do because this property is already fulfilled. And then we recursively apply that network over and over again until we're only sorting pairs. So the next type of network that we apply is the N4, and the N4 is a distance of N over 2. And it will also sort the pairs into ascending order. And you can see how the first quadruple of the sequence uh, stays unaffected and the second quadruple actually has the uh, respective pairs uh, swapped so that they're in opposite order. And then uh, we have this last stage here and the last stage will just act on the pairs that are now finally sorted into the correct order and now we end up with a sequence that is actually sorted. So we have now seen how the Botonic sort algorithm is constructed, we understand its complexity, and we also have an understanding of sorting networks and how to construct parallel sorting algorithms with sorting networks. And let us now have a look at uh, how Botonic sort would actually be implemented with CUDA. And the idea here is to also learn how to take a non-trivial parallel algorithm and port it to the GPU with CUDA. So we'll approach this in kind of a case study fashion. We'll first devise a correct version of the Botonic Sort algorithm, and we will do this in C++, and the algorithm will target CPUs. And we'll, to begin with, avoid certain language constructs, which we know we cannot use on the GPU anyway, so we will just avoid them. And in particular, we will avoid recursion and we will avoid dynamic memory allocation. So dynamic memory allocation is actually not such a big problem with the algorithm, but avoiding recursion is actually a bit harder because the networks that we defined actually were recursive. So we start out by finding a relatively optimized, correct, C++ version of the algorithm, and then we will take it and we will parallelize it, and we'll, to begin with, we will parallelize it using OpenMP, and only then we will port the algorithm to CUDA. And in my opinion, this is a approach that you should in general take with algorithms that are non-trivial, when they're parallel, and then in my opinion, it's good advice to start out on the CPU and then transform the algorithm so that it will actually be runnable on a GPU and with CUDA. And one particular reason for that is that the algorithm, when you approach it this way, is easier to debug on the CPU. And we are picking this particular algorithm for a certain reason, like the case study. It makes very much sense for this particular algorithm, because the algorithm is non-trivial, and in particular, the algorithm is not embarrassingly parallel. Like, for instance, if you take a simple rate tracer or a simple ray caster, then in its simplest form, this algorithm is just embarrassingly parallel. And you would basically just launch a one CUDA kernel that would trace all the rays in parallel, and there's actually not very much to it. So with a algorithm such as ray tracing, you would maybe port the algorithm to the GPU right away. And the approach that we are taking here actually it makes very much sense for algorithms that are not embarrassingly parallel and where the parallelization is maybe not even directly obvious. So we start out with a CPU implementation and the first thing that we are going to implement is the NN network. And in order to implement the NN network, we'll use a flag that indicates the direction in which we perform the comparisons. Like that flag will tell us if we are evaluating the network in the up or in the down direction. And we will also use templates and the iterator pattern 
to encode our input sequence, but this is not so important actually. And with all that, we just formulate our NN network. And uh, we first compute N, like we compute the size of the network actually. And then we have a branch, like an if and else. And the uh, if else will evaluate if we are going up or down. And inside the respective branch, we have a loop, and the loop iterates over n over 2 and compares the respective pairs with a stride of n over 2. Like it'll take the i element and compare it to the i plus n over 2 element in the sequence, and it will swap the two pairs if the order relation isn't fulfilled. Like it will do the same thing in the up direction and in the down direction and we'll just change the order of the comparison depending on the direction that we're currently evaluating. So now that we have this function in place, we can define the rest of our network actually. And this is the rest of our network using the nn function here. And the network consists of two parts. Like this is the first part that creates the botonic sequence. And this here is the second part that sorts the bitonic sequence. So, and if we just have a look at the first part of the algorithm, so at the make bitonic sequence part of the algorithm, we see that it is structured as follows. Like, this part of the algorithm is comprised of this recursive network that we call over and over again. Like, and the first, like the outer loop, will just iterate over the number of calls to that recursive network. Like we'll uh, first call this network of size 2, which is just the n2. And then in the second iteration, we will call this recursive network of size 4, which spans 4 wires. And the outer loop, like the one that I colored red here, is actually a loop over the executions of those networks. So then we have the second loop, like the loop that I'm indicating in green here. And the green loop is a loop over the comparator stages of the network calls. Like when the red loop iterates over the uh, recursive networks, then the green loop iterates over the comparator stages inside those recursive network calls. So and then finally we have the blue loop, and the blue loop performs, basically performs the vertical iteration so it iterates over the various calls to the NN. And you can also see that there's this flag direction. And then there's like, a, you can work this out on a sheet of paper if you like to, but there's some logic to it, how we flip the direction actually. And what you can also see is that I introduced a data dependency here. Like there's this directional flag and I'm flipping it in each loop iteration. Like when this invariant here is fulfilled, then I'm flipping it. And so uh, there's a data dependency from this inner loop here to the execution of the loop that I colored in red here. So we finally, we have the sort by tonic sequence part of the algorithm. And what you might note here is that I'm like here, I'm starting the iteration with i, and then I'm using the uh, index j, and I'm using the index k. And as you can see here, is that I'm starting with j right away. So I'm not st starting with i here, but I'm starting with j to indicate a potential correspondence between this loop and between that loop here. Um, and we will discuss this, this correspondence in a little bit. And the very first optimization that I performed, so in order to transform the algorithm so that we can actually parallelize it, is I remove the data dependency. Like, you can again work this out on a piece of paper, but suffice it to say, well, like with a bit of bit fiddling, you can actually figure out from the indices if you are moving up or if you are moving down, and I'm doing this. So the important part here is that I'm getting rid of the data dependency. So, and then the next thing that I'm doing is I'm actually inlining and merging the second part of the algorithm into the first part. Like I already said, that the first iterator variable that I'm using here is the uh, variable j in the sort sequence part. And if we go back, like the loop over i here actually goes to n, like we uh, stop the iteration when i becomes n. And here I'm basically merging the second part of the algorithm into the first part of the algorithm by performing the iteration one more time, like I'm actually iterating 
until i is n plus 1. So in the very last transformation that we can perform is uh, we can actually uh, take this loop over L here and the loop over L is basically a loop over the comparators on the various comparator stages. And the loop over L can actually also be merged into the loop over K. And this is what I'm doing next. Like I'm basically merging the K loop and the L loop giving me this one loop over all the comparisons on the comparator stages. And then I can finally parallelize my algorithm. Like I have those three versions of the algorithm. The first version with the data dependency, the second version with the data dependency removed, the next version of the algorithm with the sorting part inlined into the first part of the algorithm. And then I have this parallel version of the algorithm. So, and with that, I uh, started profiling a bit. So to get an idea where I currently am with my optimization. And for that, I compared against STD sort. And STD sort, as far as I know, implements something which is called intro sort, like basically a sorting algorithm that inspects the size of the input sequence and will either use quick sort or a simpler algorithm if the size of the input uh, sequence is small. And I just sorted 2 to the 20 integers with the std sort algorithm. And I'm expecting the std sort algorithm to be quite optimized, actually. So I wouldn't expect that I'm much faster than the algorithm right away. And I'm also acknowledging here that the work complexity of the algorithm is potentially worse than that of std sort, because on average, quick sort will perform an n log n work, while with Pythonic sort I have this n uh, log square n, as we discussed this before. So I took this first version of the algorithm with the data dependency and profiled it, and then I, then I saw that it, std sort is 10x faster than my implementation, and I'm not very surprised. And then I timed the second version of the algorithm with the data dependency removed. And there I see that std sort is still faster, but only uh, three times faster. So by removing the data dependency, by doing nothing at all other than removing the data dependency, I see a speed up of the second version of the algorithm compared to the first version of more than 3x. Like by really just uh, removing the data dependency and then probably the compiler can optimize a bit better and can maybe help me with generating a more optimal code, maybe you can even use Zimd, I don't know, like maybe the auto vectorizer did something smart there. I'm not sure. I never inspected the assembly code that was generated. So, and then I uh, took the third version, which uh, doesn't actually consist of two parts, but where the second part is merged into the first part of the algorithm. And with that, I saw a little uh, decrease in performance actually, like I went to 4x. But uh, this third version actually is parallelizable. Like I was just able to put this OpenMP directive right over the inner loop in order to parallelize it. And when executing the algorithm on an eight core machine and using eight threads, I finally was able to beat std sort. Like, which is okay, because this algorithm and optimizing the algorithm took me about two hours. Like an std sort is probably highly optimized. And the important part here is that I now arrive at an algorithm that is relatively competitive and at an algorithm that would actually also scale. So now, and only now, it makes sense to port this algorithm to CUDA. And from there, porting the algorithm to CUDA is actually fairly simple. Like I just took the inner loop of the algorithm and I made the inner loop a CUDA curl. Like this is what happens in the inner loop. And I used a one-dimensional grid and in the host program, I just call the CUDA kernel like whenever I would otherwise have called the parallel for loop with OpenMP. So from there on, it's actually really trivial because I really only have to replace the uh, parallel for loop execution that I implemented with OpenMP. I uh, only had to replace it with a CUDA kernel and I had to execute the CUDA kernel on a one-dimensional grid, and then I would do the same thing that I did on the CPU, it would do this on the GPU now. So, and this should illustrate how one would approach porting an algorithm like this to a many-core architecture that has many threads, 
and what the potential pitfalls here are, like in particular removing data dependencies, merging stuff so that the algorithm exposes more parallelism, and that inner loops are easier to parallelize. So I now ran my GPU version of the algorithm of Platonic Sort, and I saw that it was 15 times faster than STD Sort right away. I mean, there's actually still, like, they're actually stopped, but I'm convinced that there is more potential for optimization. Like, I could imagine to do something smart using shared memory, like caching some of the computation in shared memory. Maybe using dynamic parallelism, I don't know, but I could imagine that some of the kernel calls that I'm performing could actually be performed from within the kernel. So those are just ideas, so you could maybe try this. But, I mean, really, when you're interested in sorting on the GPU, you wouldn't uh, do it this way, but you would rather use a library. Like the thrust sort implementation is actually quite good. So with that, we actually arrived at the end of this part of the lecture. And as a matter of fact, we actually arrived uh, at the end of the lecture. So let us re briefly recap this part of the lecture. Like uh, we discussed parallel sorting on GPUs and we did this by discussing the Platonic sort algorithm. And we derived the platonic sort algorithm using a sorting network. And the sorting networks are actually quite nice in that basically all comparisons that we perform with the algorithm are known a priori. And therefore, this type of algorithm, of course, also lends itself to implementations using integrated circuits. And this is actually where algorithms such as platonic sort uh, come from. So, like in the very end, we discussed in kind of a case study style fashion, we discussed how one would port this algorithm to the GPU using CUDA. And this should give you a general idea how to port a not so simple algorithm to the CUDA API. And by that, you can also see how to port an algorithm like this to a many core architecture in general. Like we also arrived at a OpenMP parallelization at some point, and we actually saw that the results are actually quite similar. And I mean, generally, you would not write your own sorting algorithms to run on the GPU, but you would actually use one of the fast implementations that is available in libraries such as, for instance, Thrust. The literature here is actually fairly simple, like the literature is really only volume 3 of The Art of Computer Programming by Donald Knuth on sorting and searching, and the whole discussion of the Platonic sort algorithm and of decision trees and of all the other sorting related topics are actually taken from this book. And uh, this is the only literature I recommend here. And with that we arrived at the end of this lecture. And the only thing that I can do at this point is to wish you good luck for the exam.